This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 396, recorded on May 10th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,400 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today I have a very special guest. I have returned to my roots. I'm at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine on the 16th floor of the Annenberg Building. And my guest is professor and chair of the Department of Microbiology at the Icon School of Medicine here at Mount Sinai, Peter Palese. Welcome to TWIV. Welcome, Vincent. It is a pleasure to have you. Welcome back. As you were on TWIV in 2009, I had you talk about that the then swine related virus emergence the h one h one h one n one for a short episode, but I thought I'd come back and talk about you and your science and for full disclosure, I have to tell everyone who in case anyone doesn't know that Peter was my ph d ph d advisor I came here in nineteen uh seventy five I think and I Let me correct you. That was much more recent. <laughs> you make me younger than I am. And now I'm older than you are because <laughs> you look younger than I am. How do you stay young? <laughs> okay, okay. And I left in 1979, f- four years. And uh, when I came today to find your office, I, I walked like I'd been walking uh, every day for the last X years anyway. Um, I was honored to be your first student. And uh, the very, very best. Great uh, hands, great mind, <laughs> fantastic. I wanted to doesn't get better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your your history and some of the things you've been working on. And I, you know, I know a little bit about this, having uh, been here. And even after one leaves, I, I, at least I followed your your work over the years, just as I followed David Baltimore's work after I left his lab. I want to start at the very beginning. Where are you from originally? So I got my degree in organic chemistry at the University of Vienna. Mm-hmm. And then I came as a postdoctoral fellow to Hoffman La Roche right. in Nutley, New Jersey, and uh, just uh, stumbled into molecular biology and molecular virology and virology. When you were growing up in high school and so forth, did you always want to be a scientist? Uh, unfortunately, Vincent, I have to disappoint you. I had no <laughs> great vision. I had no uh, master plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was academically always pretty good. And I just sort of, um, without really knowing what I was doing. Well, that w- you, so you were clearly a, a talent in science that just had to emerge. Uh, I liked it always, yeah. uh, but I had a more classical education with old Greek and Latin. Uh-huh and very little uh, uh, modern science, but uh, I wasn't bad at it, and I, mm. I liked it, and I, I got into chemistry, and, uh, and sort of the rest uh, came without major um, vision, as I said before, uh, without really thinking too much about it. So um, when you went to get a PhD in organic chemistry, we- did you have any idea what you would do with that as a career? Were you thinking about being a professor of some kind? No, no. Un- unfortunately, no? Vincent, I wasn't that smart. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I obviously got a degree, and then I went down for a postdoctoral yeah. fellowship, and uh, I really okay. sort of was uh, uh, intrigued by the new technologies and uh, and kept doing it. Okay. Now, looking at your publications on PubMed, the earliest ones, a lot of them have to do with neuraminidase. Was that part of your PhD work? What did that come after? Um, so, uh, part of my um, thesis was to synthesize substrates for 
neuraminidases or sialidases, same thing. Uh, enzymes which cleave mm -hmm. off neuraminic acid from uh, carbohydrate uh, uh, have, uh, expressing proteins mostly. So it was a, a, a chemical as a, a, a chemical synthesis, and one of the enzymes which are cleaving uh, sialic acid is sialidase or neuraminidase, and specifically a viral neuraminidase, and there uh, we are talking about influenza and uh, para-influenza viruses, and that's sort of what I then became interested in it. But again, it was more... Uh, call it serendipity or uh, call it um, uh, not knowing what I was doing, uh, really. <laughs> but then, many years later, synthetic neuraminidase substrates end up being antivirals to treat influenza. Right? So it, it turned out that actually my first uh, scientific interest and uh, uh, sort of achievement, if you want to call it, was to identify the function of the viral neuraminidase, specifically of the influenza virus neuraminidase. Mm -hmm. And I used a compound which was very similar to a substrate of neuraminidase, a, what we call a transition state inhibitor, and uh, we were able to uh, uh, we were able to show, and that was in collaboration with Jerome Schulman at the time and uh, Dick Compens at the Rockefeller, we were able to show that these inhibitors of the neuraminidase actually inhibited influenza viruses per se, and Dick Compens showed that the inhibitors of the neuraminidase actually caused an aggregation of virus particles and that the virus mm -hmm. could not be released from infected cells by virtue of having its releasing enzyme, its neuraminidase, being inhibited. Right. And the neuraminidase uh, actually allows the cleavage of sialic acid on the infected cell and the virus uh, uh, cleaves off and um, remove sialic acid so that it can uh, go from the infected cell to an uninfected cell and thereby spread. And so this was very early on that I was able to identify the uh, function of this virus-associated enzyme in terms of the virus life cycle. And specifically, again, that the neuraminidase allows influenza viruses and para-influenza viruses or paramyxoviruses to really uh, leave the infected cell and spread to other cells and thereby infect uh, 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 a whole organism. And occasionally, as in the case of uh, influenza, or for example, in chicken, Newcastle disease virus can be very, very lethal and can cause real problems. So uh, these viruses having neuraminidases are can be quite um, a threat to humans as well as to uh, particularly poultry industry, chicken, turkeys, ducks, uh, etc. Mm. because they are both influenza viruses as well as Newcastle disease virus and other para-influenza viruses can actually kill poultry and uh, cause a lot of damage. I remember when I was in your lab as a student I read one of your papers on this, which you had published, where you had a influenza virus with a temperature-sensitive neuraminidase, and at the high temperatures, the virus particles, you had EMs in this paper, would cluster on the surface. And, and for years, I, I used that as an example of the first demonstration of the role of neuraminidase in letting the virus get away from the cell. Correct. So this was uh, an electron micrograph which Richard Compens, who is now at Emory, made of, of, an te of a temperature-sensitive influenza virus, uh, when grown at the high temperature, the neuraminidase is inactive, and mm -hmm. therefore the virus cannot get uh, released. And uh, both using inhibitors, which then, as you correctly pointed out, later on became FDA, Food and Drug Administration, approved uh, antiviral, anti-influenza mm -hmm. drugs. So both inhibition by a neuraminidase inhibitor 
and or, or using a temperature sensitive influenza virus when this virus is grown at an unpermissive, an unpermissive temperature, it actually uh, produces a non-functional neuraminidase and then this is like having mm -hmm. the neuraminidase inhibited and one sees these aggregates and the virus does not uh, get transmitted from one cell to the other. Yeah. Now, back in um, Vienna when you were getting your PhD, I, I noticed some of the papers had, had to do with a pig neuraminidase, is that right? <laughs> that was the source of the enzyme? <laughs> yes. You told me a story once about that. Are you willing to briefly tell it again? Yes. So, okay, so part of this was to have a neuraminidase uh, available, and one could have it from a virus, mm -hmm. but also uh, one could use uh, organs, you know, and uh, one of the organs was... Uh, a kidney from pigs, and that worked quite well. And I went to slaughterhouses and mm. uh, got these uh, squealing <laughs> pigs. Uh, they were killed there, and uh, we got fresh, warm um, um, organs. Mm. But then uh, someone said, okay, uh, that's quite interesting. The animals have it, but what's about humans? And so the next step was then that I was asked, and that this was before there were any uh, rules and regulations about that, I went to the pathology department uh, at the University of Vienna and asked whether I could have some uh, organs from deceased uh, uh, patients because I was interested whether this particular enzyme would also be present mm -hmm. in human kidneys and the next thing was then a human brain. And uh, so at that time, uh, I was a student, and they just gave me uh, the warm uh, human kidney, a warm human brain, and I put it into an ice uh, bucket, went to public transportation to my laboratory, with public <laughs> transportation to my laboratory, and worked it up, you know. Yeah. So this is something, it, it was the last century. Right? Yeah, yeah, of okay, course, so, of course. So please don't report me. You know? No, no, it's, and, uh, many things were done before and, uh, the laws came in. Yeah. So this was, uh, but it was uh, holding a warm brain in your own hands uh, was uh, something I still remember, sure. which was not that, um, was unusual to say the least. I remember when you told me this, the part that got me, it was the part being on a bus or something yes. <laughs> with a bucket between your legs and a towel covering it, yes. right? Correct. Bringing it back to the lab. That is yeah. just, and that yeah. was probably done often back then, yeah. right? And you would bring that back to the lab and, and isolate neuraminidase. And, and, and right? isolate the enzyme, yes, yeah. And, 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 and the thing was, it was a fairly unstable protein. That's why it was important mm -hmm. to get it right after uh, the poor patient died yeah. and then work it up very fast. and. I had to work actually in a cold room for uh, months of my life. It probably shortened my life for months, <laughs> uh, if not years, to have to work and isolate the enzyme. And, uh, yeah. At that time, there were, uh, it, the whole room was a cold room, and uh, you had to work there, and it was uh, less than pleasant. I remember that as well. But the brain has neuraminidase activity. The, the brain has neuraminidase. Mm -hmm. yeah, What's the, have, do we know what the function of this is? No, not really. It's a very good point. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, but it, but uh, since mm -hmm. neuraminic acid is such a ubiquitous um, component of mm -hmm. cells, mm -hmm. there is obviously some way it has to be degraded right, right. and regulated. And, uh, okay. Um, so red blood cells have neuraminic acid, basically every, every cell, cell has, yeah. and uh, it's a very good point. You know? At that point, uh, at that time, uh, the question was, do humans have that enzyme? Yeah, yeah. right. I remember uh, at scientific meetings, I, uh, we used to ski. Yes. And you told me, I mean, you're a great skier, and you would always go off with like Jeff Almond, who was another yes, great yes. skier. And once you, your wife and I went skiing because <laughs> she was far better than I, but I guess not as good as you. And you told me you grew up skiing yes, yeah. to, to school, is that right? Yes, yes, yeah. That, uh, now you're really going back. <laughs> <laughs> there was a mountain right there? You yes, could, yes. Wow. It, it was, uh, we were in the Alps, uh, the region of the Alps, of the Austrian Alps, and uh, I was in a very small village, and... Uh, we had a class, uh, I remember that all four classes were together, uh, elementary school, mm -hmm. and uh, 
I have actually very good memories, you know, uh, and uh, the guy was very supportive. He's obviously long deceased. He was mm -hmm. very, very, um, gave me things to um, think about, and uh, I'm still very thankful. So it's not this class size which is important. It is more that there's someone who really challenges you and yeah, sure. uh, can bring you uh, <laughs> along the right path. So you did a lot of skiing then. <laughs> and, and we did a lot of skiing, huh. yes. Okay. So you came to the U.S. to do a postdoc with Brian McAlslin. Now, how did you decide on him? Did someone say you should go there? or? I heard a talk by Aaron Shutkin in Europe. Ah. And uh, I, I, I liked the talk. And so I wrote to him, uh, not knowing the process or anything else. And I asked him whether he would... Uh, take someone. I didn't even notice that I was an outsider. Aaron Schrotkin was a very famous virologist at that time. And he said, no, no, young man, I'm, I'm over committed, but there is a laboratory right next door and maybe you try that one. And that's how I oh. uh, got an invitation to come to the United States. And it was in a way still the golden days, you know, the golden mm. times you know, that people were given a chance and uh, not many questions we are asked, yeah, and uh, yeah. uh, not many uh, forms filled out, not many checks we are made, you know, whether or not you got your degree. Yeah. I don't think anyone ever asked, I mean, uh, uh, checked it, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, one really had still the uh, luxury or the enormous benefit of an open country and of an open uh, society and uh, people got a chance yeah, and that I'm very thankful uh, to this day. Now I know Brian McCauslin because he discovered DNA dependent RNA polymerase in a virus, right? Correct. And when you got there had he made that discovery already? Uh, he was, uh, so this was the first DNA, the uh, first uh, polymerase associated with the virus which culminated then uh, only a few years later in uh, David Baltimore's discovery of the reverse transcriptase associated with a retrovirus. Mm. So uh, this was already at the time, so this must have been um, maybe 10 years before David Baltimore's um, Nobel Prize, uh, that Brian McAuslin found that uh, a DNA-containing virus, was vaccinia, a derivative of smallpox virus, had a polymerase. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that made him actually very famous at the time. And uh, he uh, then, when I was there, uh, was interested in identifying other enzymes associated with viruses. And uh, uh, this became a very, very important field uh, in terms of identifying and characterizing uh, the function of these enzymes. And as I said already before, reverse transcriptase is sort of the absolute culmination sure, of yeah. these uh, uh, different virus-associated uh, enzymes. But it also already showed that we can really learn a lot from viruses. and. Uh, uh, not only in terms of uh, associated enzymes, but uh, how they interact with the host. And uh, I think uh, we have profited, we uh, in terms of a field uh, in uh, biology, how viruses work and on one hand and how viruses uh, get replicated and interact uh, with different uh, host cells and different hosts. If I remember, you worked on frog virus in that lab, right? <laughs> yeah. That's Which is a pox, is that a, no, it's not a pox. Uh, virus, it right? is a DNA containing virus. Okay. It's frog virus three. And uh, it was a, a, a virus which uh, grew at low temperatures mm -hmm. and uh, was a, a virus which had quite a lot of enzymes and uh, was uh, a, a quite um, um, fertile ground uh, for those kinds of studies mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, after you spent how many years there? A few? Four? Uh, it was only one year. So one it, year? Yeah, only one year, yes. Then you came to Mount Sinai. And then I came to Mount Sinai again, Wow. sort of uh, not uh, uh, having it planned uh, in advance, and uh, just uh, stayed on. Now, 
um, what, did you apply for this job? Did you hear that there was a position available? I know that at that time, Ed Kilborn was chair. Yes, and he was building a, a, a uh, department, mm -hmm. and uh, he was interested in you know, aminic acid okay. and, uh, and sialides, and so, he, so I got one paper out in, in uh, still from, from Austria, and he saw that, and he wrote... And at the time, I had already an American address under, yeah. and uh, he wrote a letter, and uh, I, I was uh, uh, offered a job. So again, this was a time when people were really given chances, and if you grab the chance, that's sure. it. Yeah. So you came here in 1974-ish, yes. earlier? Yes, okay. <laughs> okay, because I want to put it in relation to me, because I was yeah. your first student, yes. and I came in 75, but you had been here for... Yeah. More than a couple of years. But I had gone to Cornell, and I graduated with a major in biology, not knowing what I wanted to do. And I had gone to school with Kilborn's son. He was a good friend of mine. Oh, yes, yes. Who's also Ed okay. Kilborn. He's, yeah. He was at the CDC for many years. Yes. And they lived in Ridgewood, New Jersey. And one night in, after I had graduated, I went to his house for dinner. And after dinner, the senior Dr. Kilborn came out and said hello and he said to me what are you going to do with, with your, your, life. your life and I said well I'm really interested in viruses so I've been applying to some master's programs and he said forget it get a PhD come to Mount Sinai mm -hmm. this was August already and the next day I, I called I got an interview and I got in and in September I came and uh, yeah. that's it's yeah. because of him that I came here. Then I ended right. up working in your laboratory. Interesting. So he yeah. helped yeah. both of us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you know the funny thing is, when he died, I wrote a art. I wrote a a, a blog post yeah. about what he meant yes, to my yeah. career, and his family called me and asked me to to speak at his funeral because they said all all the newspapers were vilifying him for the swine flu vaccine oh, debacle, okay. and I was the only person who, who was saying nice things about okay, him and uh, unfortunately I couldn't make it but I thought that was very touching yes yes because he did yes. mean a lot to my career you absolutely know? yeah and and I mean maybe we should talk about this swine flu I, that's absolutely yeah. on my list I was going to ask you so uh, let's go back and tell tell us what happened there was an outbreak of a few cases at so so that, that was 1976 six there was an outbreak in, on, the, on an army base mm -hmm. uh, in Fort Dix, New Jersey, uh, which um, caused the life of one of the recruits mm -hmm. who actually had been on a long march, you know, sort of like 10 hours or something, and got infect, uh, was obviously infected before, and he died of the flu. But he was also someone from a rural area, so he must have been infected while he, uh, when he was uh, on vacation or mm -hmm. when he uh, was not in the army, uh, on, on, the, on the base, and he was uh, then uh, taking this long march with luggage on his back, etc., and so uh, this poor guy actually died. And then there was evidence that about 90 uh, other recruits who were all in the barracks living in close mm. quarters were also positive in terms of uh, antibodies to the swine virus. And uh, therefore, uh, there was some concern, or there was a major concern in terms of uh, this virus, which was clearly different from the circulating seasonal influenza virus. At the time it was H3N2, right? At the time, it was H three and two, correct. Mm -hmm. So it was in uh, in sixty eight, uh, a new pandemic strain emerged, and uh, that strain is actually still with us. Yeah, you know, but certainly in nineteen sixty seven, uh, this was the predominant strain, and the seventy seventy six. Uh, I'm sorry, did you, I, you said sixty seven, but it's uh, uh, seventy six. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the H3 virus emerged in 1968, right. and then in 1976, a new virus, this which, uh, virus which was then called uh, swine virus, emerged, 
uh, associated with the death of one recruit and clear transmission mm. uh, among uh, almost 100 people. And so it was not clear whether this would be, and this was during the summertime, which is uh, unusual, but mm. uh, it obviously can happen. And uh, then uh, it was a major effort nationwide to produce vaccine, which was uh, made with a process uh, Dr. Kilburn had uh, designed and developed, which allowed the virus to grow f uh, to higher titers and therefore it was easier to make a large uh, number of doses of this vaccine. And uh, then uh, a, uh, in within a short period of time, 40 million people were vaccinated and unfortunately uh, about 400 people came down with Guillain-Barré syndrome mm -hmm. and also uh, 40 of those actually died. And uh, it was possible to trace this back to the vaccine because uh, the records were fairly g uh, good and the Guillain-Barré syndrome actually uh, started on day 15 to 17 after hmm. the vaccine was given. And that was really uh, almost uh, uh, a proof yeah, that there was a cause effect um, uh, association between vaccination and uh, this yeah. ascending uh, paralysis. So it starts with uh, uh, the limbs, the extremities, but then if the chest muscles are involved, then obviously uh, uh, people uh, uh, can die. And there's a very small number, but it's one out of a million, but it's uh, still very, it, mm. it's still mm -hmm. too high, particularly in terms of the situation that there was no a pandemic resulting from this virus. So it never got outside of Fort Dix, essentially. It right? never got outside yeah. of Fort Dix. Yeah. Now, I, just parenthetically, yeah. um, someone wrote to me, I don't know, five years ago, since I do this podcast, people can find me. And he said he was one of these recruits at Fort Dix. He really? said, I remember I got such a fever and I was knocked out for days. And he said, Interesting. what? what uh, and now I'm, I'm reading all about what happened, but they didn't tell us anything, he said. <laughs> Yeah. Now, you, I remember I was in your lab for about a year and you got the isolate and you did the state of the art at the time, RNAs T1 oligonucleotide fingerprinting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because we didn't have sequencing, right? Yeah. It was just beginning sequencing. There was no cloning. And so you would digest. First, you would label the RNA. Oh, no, digest them first with RNAs T1. And then label. And then put hot phosphate on the fibromyalgia, yeah. and then separate them in two dimensions. And this is something I learned to do here as well. Yeah. And what, when you looked at this strain, what did you see? It turned out that the Fort Dix swine virus mm -hmm. was basically indistinguishable from other swine viruses which had been circulating already for several years. And yeah. we had isolates from... Oscar Mayer, the famous sausage yeah, producer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if this exists still, this company, yeah. Oscar Mayer, but at the it time, might, might, yeah. um, they were, at the time, they were one of the biggest um, Midwest uh, producers of meat and, uh, and sausages and, uh, and had a lot of uh, uh, pig farms, I uh -huh. guess, or, or had isolate, or had, uh, uh, had a lot of uh, pigs in, um, which they processed the meat, and there were isolates which were very, very similar to mm -hmm. uh, that one, which was. Uh, these were from pigs, not from humans, right? These were from pigs, yeah. And so my interpretation at the time was that um, the virus, since the virus had been around already, you know, and again, we couldn't really, there was no sequencing, but we, we knew that it was very, very close. Mm -hmm. uh, to these uh, Midwestern pig viruses. So my argument was if it has been around already for several years uh, and hasn't really jumped into people, uh, maybe this is not the next uh, uh, virus. Yeah? And yeah. Um, I, this brought me a little bit into some conflict sure. with uh, Dr. Kilborn, who was convinced, yeah, based on his experience, that this was the next pandemic strain. And uh, it was, uh, uh, I mean, I was all for making the vaccine, but the question was whether it should be given if that virus hasn't really shown to be uh, transmitted from 
uh, person to person. So it was uh, clearly a very good idea to make such a vaccine. Uh, it could kill, there was no doubt about it, but the question was whether this is a virus which really uh, has the potential, or uh, is really a virus which gets transmitted effectively from uh, a human. So you think, human. you think we should have waited to see if it would spread and then vaccinate, uh, right? That was sort of the idea, yeah. yeah. But uh, the arguments there were also, if you don't do it, you know, then uh, maybe people will not uh, pay for it and will be mm. um, uh, reluctant to take it later. So uh, it's uh, it, it, these are difficult questions which are still with us uh, today sure. because uh, we always have, uh, there's always a threat of a new pandemic influenza virus which might um, uh, come and uh, infect large numbers of uh, humans and uh, we better be prepared to really uh, make vaccines and uh, also uh, find ways of um, limiting this, the spread of such a pandemic influenza virus. The president at the time was Gerald Ford, and I remember a famous picture of him getting his swine flu vaccine in the White House. You remember that? Yes, I saw this picture, and some people think that this sort of ill-fated uh, swine vaccine program, uh, and uh, it's, uh, that it wasn't needed, it was a waste of mm. government money, so you can see uh, that similar arguments we hear today were used at the time, and uh, uh, President Ford was um, sort of, quote, blamed yeah, yeah, for sure. this uh, sort of useless and, need, and, and needless vaccination program mm -hmm. and uh, that supposedly made up the small percentage uh, which uh, yeah. caused his uh, losing the election. I met a guy years ago who claimed he had Guillain-Barre after this, yeah, the swine yeah. flu vaccine. He said it was horrible, yeah. Yes. No, no, it is, it is a serious disease. Yeah, it is one where uh, people are really paralyzed. In most instances, it uh, uh, sort of subsides and uh, people yeah. completely recover. But as the numbers in, the term, in terms of the swine flu from 1976, the numbers where there are 40 million vaccinated, and uh, 40 died, yeah? so yeah, it's one out yeah. of a million, and 400 uh, were, I think, hospitalized even. Mm -hmm. So it is, it, it is quite a, a dramatic disease, and uh, uh, people have, I think that's an important point, Vincent, people have tried to sort of find out whether other influenza virus vaccines, mm -hmm. other year later, et cetera, et cetera, also can cause uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome, and it appears that this was really associated with that particular uh, virus or that particular mm -hmm. hemagglutinin, which is the important uh, surface glycoprotein on influenza virus, so that it was really this particular swine influenza virus hemagglutinin which was associated with the emergence uh, with uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, it is much more difficult to prove when you don't have these records and you don't have a million people vaccinated on the same day. Yeah. So yeah. that makes it much, much more difficult to, to get uh, a proof. But it appears that none of the subsequent vaccines, be it seasonal or pandemic, uh, was actually associated with a Guillain-Barre syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with, with that disease and complication. So it is really uh, something which we, um, is was a hard lesson to learn and something we cannot completely exclude but uh, in, in the future. But it appears that all other vaccines, all other influenza virus vaccines, and I haste to say uh, all other vaccines are not associated with yeah. in terms of uh, this uh, uh, horrible uh, adverse reaction. Of course, now we're seeing it with Zika virus infection, right? Uh, I was just trying to make sure in terms of vaccines. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, clearly, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome is triggered 
by natural infections. Yeah. And even, I think that's another important point for our listeners, even there was a direct association with Guillain-Barre syndrome and the vaccine, mm -hmm. if the virus would have circulated, right. it would have probably uh, would have caused many more cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome right. as compared to uh, the very, very uh, low incidence of um, the vaccine-associated uh, numbers of um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. So, yes, vaccine, uh, very rarely, such as probably the mm. uh, uh, swine virus vaccine of 1976, is associated or was associated with this disease, but natural infections uh, have probably a much higher incidence in terms of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. And we should really understand that uh, uh, vaccination is really important, even, even if there are some side effects. You know, the other famous person who got Guillain-Barre was Albert Sabin. Late in his life, I think in his 90s, I remember meeting him and he told me, he said, I had Guillain-Barre, it was horrible. He said, Interesting. It, was, he said it was like having polio, yes, except that yes. he recovered in the end yeah. as well. And he has no idea where. So he, he was not the vaccine. Not the vaccine, yeah. was not associated with any infection. Or, or known infections. Known infections, yeah. yeah, there must have been yeah. some. Because it's thought to be an autoimmune disease, right? Yes, it, it is sort of thought to be that so, for example, let me go back to the influenza virus, hemagglutinin, that some uh, amino, a stretch of amino acids mm -hmm. uh, is actually inducing an immune response, and it is mimicking some epitope on a uh, basic myelin protein or some mm -hmm. other uh, neuronal protein, and so that there's a sort of a, a really an autoimmune disease caused by uh, the virus. So it's this mimicry of uh, an epitope on the virus inducing an antibody, and that antibody recognizes a self-epitope uh, in, in, in the patient. So that's sort of the mechanism by which uh, it is thought that these uh, events or these uh, disease uh, um, uh, diseases can be uh, triggered uh, that it is an antibody uh, in terms of an autoimmune yeah. reaction. Now, uh, the, other, the other story I remember during my time here, which happened a year later, and there was a new H1N1 detected um, in 1977. And again, Correct. you got samples and you did your RNAs T1. Tell, yes. tell us about that one. So, uh, in 1977, we unexpectedly got another influenza virus circulating, and that is referred to as uh, the Russian virus because the early reports suggested that uh, this, H, this H1N1 virus uh, was uh, first isolated in Russia. And uh, this virus was actually uh, very similar to earlier viruses and our analysis, with, which Dr. Racaniello just mentioned, namely using uh, a T1 analysis of the RNA, ribonuclease T1 digestion, and then separation of the oligonucleotides on a two-dimensional gel, allowed us to say that this 1977 virus was very similar to earlier 1950 strains. And uh, one of the consequences of that was that people who had been pre previously infected with that virus in 1950 or earlier were actually immune mm -hmm. against this new 1977 strain. So that only young people, younger than 27, 25, really got infected uh, with this new uh, H1N1 virus. And interestingly, that one co-circulated then from 1977 uh, with the other H3 uh, influenza virus until uh, 2009 when yet another pandemic strain actually uh, emerged. The, the, uh, for some years we still have this 77 H1N1 or is that extinct now? Uh, that the, the, uh, the, uh, the descendants, so to speak, of the 1977 mm -hmm. strains are now extinct, extinct and okay. we have a new H1, 
which is referred to as pandemic H1, <laughs> the nomenclature is just terrible. I mean, just uh, <laughs> roll your eyes, yeah, and uh, just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, don't even don't get turned off yeah, with these uh, nomenclatures. But uh, it's it's still a, a virus which is uh, can cause a lot of uh, morbidity and mortality and uh, is quite uh, unpredictable. So right now, we have actually the H3 virus circulating from starting in 1968, and mm -hmm. this virus has been changing, has drifted, antigenic drift, uh, all these years. So we still have these H3 viruses circulating with us. And since 2009, we have yet another H1 virus, a pandemic H1 and one virus circulating. And uh, we have actually two different influenza B virus mm -hmm. strains which are uh, circulating at the same time. So the vaccine strains which we uh, have to take, uh, which uh, should be administered, uh, is uh, consisting of four different components, an H3 component, Mm -hmm. a, what we uh, refer to as P-pandemic H1 component, and then two different influenza B virus components. Now, back in 77, when the H1 emerged, the Russian flu, why did you decide to compare it to older isolates? Was that because of the serological data that you referred to? Yes. So then, uh, so, uh, so this 1977 mm -hmm. Russian strain was uh, serologically fairly early in the game identified as an H1 virus and then we just tried to compare it okay. to earlier to the swine virus and that certainly was different but then it turned out very surprisingly that uh, this virus was very similar to a strain which was circulating in uh, nine, around 1950, 1951. Mm. So since then, that strain has been sequenced, and it, that, that holds and that, up, right? That, that, uh, this technology was very, very good for closely related viruses, and the uh, sequencing, which obviously we have now hundreds of thousands of influenza viruses have been sequenced, and that has been confirmed that the 1977 H1 and 1 strain is basically identical to the 1950 strain. Yes. So to this day, we still don't understand how that strain reemerged uh, 27 years later. Right? Uh, correct. There is still not. Uh, we, we really don't understand how that uh, really happened. Yes. Like one of the ideas is that it was a vaccine trial on in going in Russia or China, right? But no one can prove anything, I suppose. And the other possibility is that the virus was really. Uh, in an animal uh, population where it appears that there is less change going mm. on mm -hmm. or that it was actually frozen in a, bo in a bird or in, uh, <laughs> right. uh, in uh, a, uh, maybe water supplies even. You know, so yeah. it is still not clear why this virus is really so similar. I know for, for a while the, there's, a, there's a group of people who <clears throat> think that virology is too dangerous, as you know, and they use this as an example of a lab accident. But recently, someone did an analysis, I think it was at the University of Pittsburgh, and they concluded it, it likely was not a lab accident, the release of this uh, 1950s vintage H1N1. So th I think that's good because uh, it was a lot of ammunition for th these individuals who say, you know, you can't, you, we can't con contain things in laboratories, and it's, it's just not correct. This episode is sponsored by Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. It's founded by John Hendricks, the founder of Discovery Communications. You'll find there over 1,400 titles and 600 hours of content. It's available in 196 countries worldwide, and here on TWIV we reach most of those countries, so you, you're able to get it. And... The streaming is available on many platforms. You can stream on a web app, on Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. Now, what do they have at Curiosity Stream? A wide variety of science and technology content, which our listeners will probably like, but also nature, history, and many other topics as well. You'll also find over 50 hours of 4K content, which they've just you know, launched, and of course, they're building to make that library even bigger. In addition to documentaries, they also have interviews 
and lectures. For example, Stephen Hawking's Universe. Stephen Hawking's Traces the History of Astronomical Theories and Technology. Next World featuring Michio Kaku talking about the future of technology, virtual reality, AI, and other technological questions. They even have some programs on viruses. One of them is called Viruses Destruction and Creation, where they talk about Zika virus, of course. Life on Earth, a series that explores biodiversity of our bodies, and many, many others. With Curiosity Stream, you get real science shows and not just reality TV science shows like the ones plaguing cable TV. There are monthly and annual plans available, and the plans start at just $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee or the cost of one title on competing on-demand platforms. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIV. Let's talk a little bit about uh, influenza vaccines. Um, one of the problems with flu vaccine, as you've alluded to, there are, there are minor changes in the virus, possibly from year to year. There are pandemic shifts. So we always have to be making uh, new strains. And uh, I know you and many other people are interested in what we call a universal flu vaccine. Tell us a little bit about that. So influenza virus vaccines, um, very unique in a way that each year there has to be a new formulation and uh, some years uh, one or two of the components have to be changed over the previous year and sometimes all three or all four uh, uh, components, two A's and two B's, have to be changed. So that is uh, very difficult and unlike any other vaccine which we have, that it has to be reformulated and readministered every year. Unfortunately, the vaccine is not as good as, for example, a measles vaccine or mumps vaccine or a rubella vaccine. In other words, the efficacy of these vaccines is not as good as we would like it to be, and that has to do with the um, peculiar antigenic variation so that when we make the vaccine, it's always a year uh, earlier from the time when we actually uh, take the vaccine or when the vaccine is needed in terms of the mm -hmm. particular circulating strain. There is even the other complication that uh, we have the seasonality in terms of influenza viruses, which are in the northern hemisphere from November to February. This year, crazy, let me just tell you, we have uh, influenza right now at the end of April and beginning of May. I, I, I don't remember ever, ever yeah. having heard that. There was not much in the U.S. all winter, right? It, it's very, very strange. Yeah. Yeah? So there were confirmed cases of flu. As a matter of fact, uh, I know it so well because my wife came down with it, even though she had the vaccine. Yeah? So uh, in, that was, I think, the last day of April she was there. She was... Uh, diagnosed with, mm. and, and, and the test was a really good one, it was very clear. Was it an H1 or an H3? It was an H, it, it was on the NP, nuclear protein test. It, was, okay. it, it did not specify it, but, but again, yeah. um, it is very unusual that we, so this was just a, a week ago, you know, very unusual uh, this, uh, epidemiology, really. So the vaccine, and as I mentioned, my wife took it because I obviously insisted on it, <laughs> Uh, it's, Which she's one did she get, the inactivated or the flu mist? Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think you've told me in the past you prefer the flu mist, right? Yes, but it is not licensed for uh, people older than 49. That's so, right. So, so you, you, have I, to you get, and I are out. <laughs> so, uh, no, you are not out yet, Vince. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so <laughs> it is, you, if, if you want to have a live virus vaccine, a physician has to really... A, a, a prescribe it's, it for you. It's not licensed because it hasn't been tested in that age group, basically, uh, right? Yes. Yeah. And I don't think they make enough to be able to cover everyone anyway, right? So, so the vaccine really is, uh, I think it is better than its reputation, 
but it is not optimal. And the other problem is that it has to be uh, given every year, which really makes it very difficult in terms of getting everyone mm -hmm. uh, to Walmart or to a physician or into an emergency room. So, um, so the idea, therefore, is can we do better? Can we make a vaccine which is as good as uh, a uh, measles, mumps, rubella, wonderful vaccines, uh, even uh, pneumococcal, etc.? So uh, the idea then is that you try to make a vaccine, an influenza virus vaccine, which uh, can be given only once a lifetime or maybe every 20 years. And one way, and, and this is sort of also, let's remind ourselves, we don't have vaccines, for example, against HIV. We don't have uh, vaccines against uh, hepatitis C. And one of the reasons is that these viruses are undergoing antigenic, a lot of variation, antigenic variation. And as we all know, HIV uh, occurs in many, many different flavors and uh, in one would have to have a vaccine which is really inducing an immune response against a variety of different strains. And the same is true for hepatitis C. Now, uh, let me say, I firmly believe we will have vaccines against hepatitis C and against uh, HIV as well. Uh, hopefully, well, I'm pretty convinced that for flu, the problem is a much simpler one. Nevertheless, we have to really deal with this uh, problem that we have every year a different variant popping up mm -hmm. and that the vaccines, we, vaccine formulations we make are not always optimal in terms of protecting against the actual strain which is then circulating uh, after uh, a sufficient uh, a, a time which may be nine months, uh, a year after uh, the surveillance ad identified a particular strain. And the idea we have, and we are working on that uh, at uh, Mount Sinai, and this is a collaborative effort between the laboratories uh, of Dr. Adolfo Garcia Sostre and uh, Florian Kramer and myself, we are trying to make a vaccine which uh, is inducing an immune response against the conserved region of the virus. And that means the conserved region, particularly of the hemagglutinin and also of the neuraminidase. So we are trying to uh, redirect the immune response of a regular vaccine, which is mostly inducing an immune response against the uh, very top of the uh, surface of the virus, mm -hmm. against the head of the hemagglutinin. Uh, in contrast, we are trying to uh, make a vaccine which would uh, induce and make an antibody response against the stalk, against the conserved stem uh, of the hemagglutinin as well as the conserved region of the uh, neuraminidase. So that is what we are trying to do. It works very, very well in animals, uh, in mice, in guinea pigs, in, uh, in ferrets. But again, as we all know, mice are not men, ferrets <laughs> are not humans, etc. <laughs> so this is really uh, something which we have to use. Uh, we can only find out in the best animal uh, model we have, and that is uh, our humans right. and ourselves. And so we are hoping that these uh, vaccine constructs which aim towards making an immune response against the conserved regions of the hemagglutinin and the neuromediates mm -hmm. will be put into uh, people, first in man, first in humans, uh, studies within uh, hopefully 2016, uh, 2017. Mm -hmm. And then we obviously uh, the next question is, how long will that immunity last? So uh, if we say it lasts a lifelong, a lifetime, uh, then the FDA could say, okay, so let's wait a lifetime until uh, <laughs> we can really be sure that this vaccine is um, uh, protective for uh, 10 years, 20 years, etc. So there will be a, ma a major challenge 
in terms of yes, the vaccine the vaccine has to be effective against the currently circulating strains and then also against uh, strains which will be uh, circulating in the future. Would it have to protect against any pandemic strain that might be currently in our, animals? Our our approach should include protection against any influenza virus mm-hmm. strains. It would actually uh, uh, there is there are two d- different groups of hemagglutinin, and mm-hmm. we would mm-hmm. make uh, which covers all uh, influenza virus uh, influenza viruses which we have uh, so far um, uh, discovered mm-hmm. in humans as well as in animals, uh, and also all influenza B virus strains. So yes, the uh, the uh, the goal is to make. Mm. A vaccine which would really protect against all uh, all influenza viruses. Now, again, if we talk about uh, HIV, there it isn't good enough to reduce the viral load by a factor of a hundred, uh, because as we all know, the virus mm. uh, is in, uh, incorporated into the genome and uh, of human cells, and that wouldn't be good enough for flu if we are just able to reduce the, uh, the viral load by a factor of 10 or 100, that would be perfectly fine. Yeah. So I, I think uh, it is a much easier problem than making an HIV vaccine. It is an easier problem than making a effective an effective hepatitis C vaccine. But again, uh, the proof is in the pudding. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is really a question whether uh, such a vaccine will be uh, protective enough, one, and long-lasting right. enough. And that yeah. can only be done by uh, human trials, and uh, uh, we shall see. Right. So I remember one of your approaches was to cut off the head of the hemagglutinin and just immunize with the stalk, but now you're putting irrelevant heads on, which focuses the immune response to the stalk? Yes, because what it does is we are vaccinating with a construct, uh, with viruses actually, which have a very a completely uh, to human unknown head. Mm-hmm. And by doing this, uh, so we have, we have no recollection of that, but we have some uh, B memory cells against the neuraminidase and against the stalk. And then uh, if we then vaccinate a second time with another virus, which is identical to the first one, but has again a mm. different head, we believe that uh, the immune system should recognize these conserved regions much better than the new one. Right. And with that, we hope that uh, one can mm-hmm. uh, assure that such an immune response uh, is long-lasting and uh, protective. And uh, we believe that, for example, um, uh, so we don't know yet what the regimen should be, whether there should be an interval from the first immunization Mm -hmm. to the second of three months, six months, uh, and all of that will have to be tested in humans. This is going to be an inactivated vaccine? Uh, It can be. uh, This is a very good question. We have two different kinds of vaccines at the present time. Mm -hmm. For flu, one is an inactivated, not inactive, an inactivated vaccine, which is a virus which has been treated mostly with formaldehyde. And then it is injected and we make an immune response against the uh, inactivated virus. But this is a good uh, immune response against the proteins of the virus. Or we have live virus vaccines which are... Uh, sprayed into the nose and uh, also induce a mucosal immunity. So these are uh, two different FDA-approved versions of the same vaccine, and our universal vaccine approach can actually be tried with both platforms. Mm. can be live or killed or a combination of those or right. even with uh, adjuvant. So mm-hmm. all of that will have to be tested uh, and uh, they, uh, our approach does not require any kind of platform. It should work with a live, a kill, mm-hmm. or even yeah. a protein one. Now, in w- when you're infected with influenza, most of the immune response is directed against the head of the HA, right? But some people make antibodies against the conserved stalk. That's, is that correct? Yes. So uh, one of the reasons why we believe that uh, this is a reasonable uh, approach to vaccinate against these conserved regions is that some people 
have, in particular, uh, people who have been exposed to many different strains make antibodies against these conserved regions, and we believe that these people are actually more uh, protected uh, mm. than uh, other uh, people. So, and I think it's, it's conventional wisdom that not everyone uh, drops dead during the winter season when mm. we have um, influenza virus uh, circulating, but rather only some people. And we believe that the uh, presence of such neutralizing antibodies against conserved parts of the of, of influenza viruses is actually a way how mm. many people are protected and um, do not come down with disease. And uh, we, we hope that we will just sort of make everyone like that, that uh, everyone will have these protective uh, immune responses and thereby not come down uh, with, uh, uh, w with the flu and that the mortality and morbidity would be uh, dramatically lowered. So you think this will go into cl into humans in the next couple of years? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, I hope uh, I hope to sixteen, mm -hmm. uh, twenty sixteen, certainly uh, twenty seventeen. I, I look forward to it. I get my flu vaccine every year. You should. Uh, since I left your lab, and uh, I look forward to this one. I think it would be great. As you say, if people didn't need to get a flu shot every year, it would really, it would really help. Uh, overall uptake of the flu vaccine, if you could take it once every 10 or 20 years, right? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, uh, very few people know that if you are infected in 2016 with one particular influenza virus, we're actually immune against that particular strain for, for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, uh, humans, it's not that we can't make a long-lasting protective immune response against influenza. It is just that the virus constantly changes, right. and uh, theoretically, I would argue that uh, it should, I mean, you said 10 years or 20 years, I think, and maybe I'm dreaming here, mm -hmm. uh, maybe that could be really for a lifetime. Okay. I look forward to it. Good. Uh, that would, that vaccine would also protect us against H5N1, avian influenza H5N1. It's theoretically, uh, no, no, th not, not theoretically. Uh, it does protect against H5 and 1, which are the famous uh, avian influenza virus. In an so animals, right. we can protect mice, guinea pigs, and ferrets against an H5 and 1 mm -hmm. uh, infection and challenge as well. And so, therefore, we would argue and we would hope, and again, mice are not men, etc., you know, uh, we would hope that uh, a, such a vaccine would also protect against the uh, infamous H5N1, which is also referred to as the avian flu, which, as I always say, if you are a chicken, it's a really bad virus. And uh, people have uh, sort of feared for many years that such, such a virus, the H5N1, the avian influenza virus, may jump into humans. And even though I don't believe that this is sort of... Uh, a foregone conclusion that these uh, very dangerous chicken viruses really will uh, jump into humans and cause uh, a pandemic where there is an effective transmission from person to person. Those few cases, it's several hundred cases of H5N1 infections in humans where there was serious morbidity and also uh, death is really the result of people coming into contact with large amount of the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, that is when uh, an animal handler in an open uh, life poultry market or in uh, 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 farms where uh, poultry could be ducks, could be chicken, could be uh, turkeys, that uh, only uh, when people, humans, really get infected with large amounts of the virus. Uh, do they come down with serious disease where they have to be hospitalized and occasionally can die? But the evidence that the virus is transmitted, like regular influenza viruses are, mainly from human to human, there is no evidence that, uh, or no compelling evidence that there is widespread transmission from human to human with an H5N1 influenza virus, which is uh, a avian influenza virus.
Yeah. Now, there are a number of people who are interested in why we don't get transmission among mammals. And as you know, a number of years ago, Fouchier and Kawaoka adapted H5N1s to pass by aerosol among ferrets. And this, as you well know, was met with a lot of outrage. Uh, the results were initially censored. And now we have a moratorium, I think is a direct consequence of that work, uh, in the U.S. on transmission experiments with uh, influenza and uh, coronaviruses as well, I believe. Now, I, you know where I stand on this, and I, I wonder what you think about this. Is it reasonable to prevent this kind of work? So, uh, clearly, a work, a work with viruses uh, should not be stopped. And I believe that uh, particularly work with animals and ferrets, uh, including ferrets, mice, can teach us a lot. And I believe that uh, we should be very careful in terms of preventing uh, research and scientific uh, progress in, by prohibiting uh, certain experiments uh, when they are not proven to really uh, cause uh, a, a major uh, threat to humans. So uh, having said that, uh, I also want to make clear that these experiments which involve the passage of influenza viruses in ferrets were interesting experiments and they showed that one can increase the transmission in, an, in a ferret from in a ferret model from one ferret to the other. But what was not clear in the beginning is that these viruses, which gained uh, the function of better transmissibility, also lost or lost uh, the uh, ability to cause uh, disease in ferrets. So while the uh, virus transmitted better in the ferret, it also lost its virulence characteristics in, in, the, virus, in, in, in the ferret. So it really became, I think, even for ferrets, less of a, a threat because it uh, had lost uh, quite a lot of pathogenicity uh, and uh, um, the effects uh, on killing those animals. Having said that, I also felt very strongly that this passaging experiment didn't really prove that or it didn't make this virus more dangerous for humans. Rather, it was uh, a better transmission in, in animals, in ferrets, and uh, not necessarily an increase in uh, transmissibility in humans. So I think uh, we should very carefully look at these experiments and understand them well uh, and uh, not uh, really um, uh, put this up to a judgment of the press or of the uh, uh, people who are trying to uh, stop a legitimate research. So I think these uh, viruses which were passaged in ferrets were made more transmissible in ferrets again, lost activity, lost virulence in the ferret, and fortunately we don't have to um, it, is, it is basically impossible to find out whether such viruses are more transmissible in humans, but my guess from all we know in terms of um, adapting some viruses to certain hosts, usually they lose their ability to replicate in another host mm. quite efficiently. It's so the basis for making vaccines. Right? Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jenner, 300 <laughs> years ago, uh, already thought about this and was quite successful in making a very good vaccine by using a virus which was passaged in uh, cows and then lost uh, a good deal of uh, virulence uh, in humans. And that was uh, one of the biggest success stories which we have in medicine. The eradication of smallpox. Uh, right. The eradication of smallpox. At the moment, we have a moratorium on transmission research with influenza and coronaviruses. And my understanding is that later this year, the government has, the U.S. government has commissioned two studies on the risks and benefits of these studies. And they're going to decide uh, the future of this work. Do you have any sense of, of uh, what the outcome will be? You're well connected. I'm afraid it will be dictated by 
um, people who are more concerned about the potential uh, problems and potential um, uh, threats here yeah, than by actual uh, real scientific criteria. And uh, my understanding is that uh, it uh, that the concerns against such experiments go high up in the uh, political um, uh, system and that a lot of politicians are feeling that uh, we shouldn't do those experiments. I feel the other way around. We should be uh, become more knowledgeable in terms of these viruses. Uh, we are facing uh, one uh, potential threat after the other, whether it's Zika virus, whether it's Ebola virus, or many of the other um, Flavy viruses which are lurking uh, in jungles, etc., uh, uh, behind every tree. So I would rather have a solid and um, effective uh, research establishment which uh, is doing those experiments under the right um, uh, safety conditions. And uh, but it should be a a vibrant uh, research uh, environment which is really uh, trying to ask those questions and find antivirals and better vaccines against such viruses. I have one more question for you. You've had an incredibly long and productive career. I remember when I was in your lab, you used to come in all the time on Saturdays, you could be coming in here. Are you just as excited about science as when you started? I think we have a fantastic uh, time in front of us. We have great challenges. As I said before, we have Zika, which is uh, really very, very uh, uh, threatening, I believe. We have uh, viruses and bacteria, uh, drug resistance uh, against these pathogens. I think uh, we have great uh, future in terms of modifying uh, those uh, uh, pathogens, making them hopefully work for us. Uh, CRISPR is a fantastic new technology. Uh, maybe we can eliminate the malaria by eliminating uh, uh, the mosquitoes and um, which are carrying uh, the disease, c carrying the the organ, the, the pathogen. So I feel we have uh, a great uh, future to make uh, a better environment for uh, people to live in a safer environment, but also from a scientific standpoint of view, it is very, very exciting. And I hope that a lot of young people will go into this field. I remember back when I was in your lab, we thought our techniques were the greatest. And now they're just they really amazing. Are. Now, they're they're really, really now are. they really are, aren't they? <laughs> the things that you can do. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've also been privileged to be part of that. You can find this episode and all the other episodes of This Week in Virology at iTunes at microbe.tv slash twiv, also at Google Play Music. And if you have questions or comments, send them to twiv at microbe.tv. My very special guest today has been Peter Palazzi, Chair of Microbiology here at the Icon School of Medicine of Mount Sinai, and of course, my PhD thesis advisor. It's been an honor talking with you. Thank you so much. It, the honor is on my side, Vincent. Thank you so much. Great career, and I look forward to uh, much more. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>